Welcome to, uh, as David said, our course in the Objectivist Ethics, and this lecture is about the nature of ethics. I want to begin just with a course overview, and then I'll get into the details of what I want to present today. So in conceiving this course in Objectivist Ethics, we thought what we wanted to offer was for people who you know, knew the basics of objectivism, a chance to dig deeper into the Objectivist Ethics. And we wanted to do it in a kind of different way. This is actually particularly a bee in my bonnet, something I care about, obje about objectivism. Because objectivism is a fact-based, systematic philosophy, and it's not a dogma, it's not that you have to go through it one way. It's not that there's certain, a certain privileged order to the facts. The facts are interrelated and we can come at them in many different ways and we can see different aspects and, and different uh, richness in the ideas if we come at them in a little bit of a different way. So the structure of this course reflects an attempt to try and do that. And in particular, uh, treatments of the objectivist ethics usually begin with something about the foundations of ethics. Uh, altruism versus egoism. Uh, the importance of pursuing happiness in life. Da dum. And that's wonderful. That's, that's important and it's key. But what we've done here is split the meta ethics into two lectures. Um, we'll be, uh, David will be doing the selfishness part in the next session. In this session, I'm going to be talking about something uh, more general about the, the foundations of ethics. And in particular, something that's been. Um, brought to my attention many times in talking about ethics with other philosophers and talking with other people about ethics is just how much the very way objectivism comes at ethics is different. Setting aside the whole issue of egoism. So what I want to talk about is those aspects of the, the fundamental conception of ethics in objectivism that's apart from the egoism that make it distinctive and why they're important and distinctive and what the reasons are for them. And then once we have the meta-ethics out of the way, we're going to move into talking about what uh, philosophers call the normative ethics, the, the discussion of the how you should live part. You know, not just the foundation, but the how it cashes out in how you should live. And here also we've done something a little different than is normal. It is normal in explanations of the objectivist ethics to talk about, of course, that it's an egoist ethic. It's about the virtue of selfishness. But it's not solipsistic. It doesn't think other people don't exist. So generally, when we talk about the ethics, like if you go on to our website and see my lectures on the virtues that are in our webinars section, um, you'll see that in presentations like that, or say, and if you read David's and my The Logical Structure of Objectivism, you'll see that when we talk about uh, values and virtues, we talk about the individual living as an individual, and we talk about the individual in society all at once. Now, objectivism doesn't think that ethics is just about dealing with other people, but it doesn't mean that ethics isn't about dealing with other people. After all, we deal with other people a lot. But for this course, what we've done is broken those two things out apart. And there's a reason for it, which is that um, in the core logic of the objectivist ethics, in the core way of thinking, the requirements of the life of the individual without regard for society, without thinking about the, the, the situation of the person in society, is at the center of the conception of what the good life is and how it's lived. And so that's what I'm going to talk about in my talk, uh, Ethics for the Individual, in the afternoon. And then uh, Alexander Cohen will come in and bring in the social aspect uh, uh, separately. And then uh, David Kelly will come back to talk about two particular social ethics, justice and benevolence, uh, on which he's an expert, and uh, enrich our understanding of those. So in essence, we're going to be um, taking apart the normal exposition of the objectivist ethics to try and show certain things about the arguments for it, the logic of it, the reasons for it, 
uh, the richness of it. That's what we're trying to do. So I'd like to go on then and start this exploration of the, the, the meta-ethics of objectivism or the foundation by talking about the nature of ethics. What is ethics on the objectivist conception? And that's what I want to talk about here. And I want to talk about why we need ethics. And then I'm going to try and say some things about the requirements of a sound ethical system uh, without regard. And then talk about some fundamental, some um, concepts in ethics, values and virtues, and the virtue of integrity, uh, all of which we can make some sense of um, in this context, again, without even going to the egoism of the objectivist ethics, mm -hmm. without even going there. So what is ethics on the objectivist account? Objectivist is a code of, uh, objectivist, ethics, ethics is a code of principles by which to guide one's choices in life. Ethics are those principles to guide your choices. Another way people think of ethics sometimes is that ethics is the branch of philosophy that discusses questions of what are good and evil, what's the difference between right and wrong, but these are questions about guiding one's choices, really. Now why do we need ethics? Well, fundamentally we need ethics for uh, three basic reasons. One of those is that we have free will. We have to make choices. We're making choices all the time. So the question naturally comes up for beings like us, uh, how should we behave? Uh, this isn't a problem for my computer. My computer doesn't have free will. It behaves as it behaves. It will never occur to it. It concurs to me to ask how it should behave and how I want it to behave, um, but it doesn't have to recur to the decision of how to behave. And the other thing is that our choices matter. So we have choices and our choices matter. And again, in saying this, we don't really have to go down to the egoism of the objectivist ethics to note this. We just note that people care about things. You, you're living a life. You're involved in all sorts of different things. You've got ideals that matter to you. And yes, your own life matters to you. All these things matter to you. Your choices matter. And of course, the other thing is that we're beings of conceptual consciousness. We're beings that, that think in terms of uh, abstractions. And saying that we have conceptual consciousness means that our awareness is based in our perception of reality, but that we think in terms of concepts that are abstract and universal. Uh, they're abstract in that they um, abstract from the differences among particulars, so that if we say that, we're, that all of you all in this room are people, and yet you're all different in the way you look, and your ideas and thoughts and everything about you, many things, you're all different, and yet uh, we, abstractly, we think of all of us as people because of the similarities we share. And uh, our concepts are universal, and that they apply to, to many things, like all you know, when we say people, we mean all people everywhere, uh, anywhere. And of course, the wonderful thing about, con about the conceptual consciousness for us um, is that then this allows us to experience a unit economy. It allows us to use a small mind to comprehend everything, to comprehend all of reality. I can speak, I can understand something about all people everywhere uh, without uh, having to think about them all in their particular detail because I'm empowered by concepts. And relevant for ethics, um, when we form our concepts into propositions and form those propositions into principles, we, we have a need out of unit economy to grasp principles where what we mean by principles are propositions that identify fundamental truths related to an area of knowledge. Because by understanding principles, um, then we understand a lot about a subject. When you understand key abstract principles, they're going to explain many, many details for you or help you understand many of those details. So this is why we need a code of principles 
to guide our choices, we need a code of principles because we need to identify fundamental propositions, fundamental truths that are relevant to all our choices and that are, will help us make good choices in life. Now, having said these things about uh, ethics, having said that the basis of ethics is that we have free will and our choices matter and we have conceptual consciousness, um, I just want to note that just on this issue alone, I find in talking with a lot of people who say they're doing ethics, they aren't thinking about this. They're thinking about something else. And I want to speak about a few examples or two fun fundamental questions. One is that I said that um, choices matter. They matter. But matter for what? I find that a lot of um, people who uh, talk about ethics um, are not very clear about whether the well-being of the agent or the, the benefit of the, the agent of ethics matters at all for ethics. Now, there are eudaimonist ethics, like uh, Aristotelian ethics, uh, objectivism is a eudaimonist ethic, that hold that the well-being of the agent is a central concern. I mean, there are ethical schools that hold this. Uh, but probably the majority of ethical uh, ideas uh, accepted in the academy uh, aren't this way. For, there are a couple types of uh, ethics of impersonal duty. For instance, there's Kantian ethics. You know, Kant uh, argues that uh, he wants to put ethics on a sound footing uh, by uh, relating it to um, analytic ideas, ideas that are a priori, that are before any encounter with experience. And then he's going to come up with duties or rules for us to follow that are derived by an exercise of logic apart from any experience of our lives at all. Any at all. I mean, the, he thinks that the facts about our lives will be relevant because you're going to have to apply those rules um, to your life. To, to, you know, you're going to have to apply it in your life. So the facts, he calls this philosophical anthropology, would be relevant in that sense, but to come up with the rules, no. Your life isn't relevant. And that seems very peculiar to me, because, I, you're, because why are you doing ethics? If you have nothing in the game, what? I, I, don't, I don't really understand. And there's another example, uh, another common form of ethics is divine command ethics. This is most religious ethics are like this. And they, the people say um, that goodness derives from the supernatural, say it derives from God. So goodness derives from God. And there's, an, there's a supernatural authority who determines what's right or wrong. And to be good is to be right with that supernatural authority. Um, and uh, to be bad is to be out of line with what that supernatural authority wants. But again, in this case, ethics is divorced in its fundamental conception from really anything that matters directly for the individual. For the, you know, uh, again, you, in this conception, so in Kant's conception, why would ethics matter? Because of concerns about the internal logic of uh, um, ideas that are unrelated to any empirical fact? Okay, but we, we are all empirical facts. I mean, even Kant accepts that. So it's a peculiar. I mean, he, they've got reasons. There's all you could talk about. There's much more to be said about Kantian ethics, but that's just peculiar. And again, on the religious ethics, the deity wants something. Yeah? And so? so I find that peculiar. That's one peculiar aspect. And here's another, uh, there's another kind of ethics that's popular these days called evolutionary ethics. And here, the, the idea is that people are talking about ethics, but they've ignored the fact that we have free will, or they, in fact, even actively deny it. So in this conception of ethics, well, at first, you have to realize that they're, they're coming from a, 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 a view of ethics where they think, ethics is rooted in human intuitions or feelings about what's right and wrong. 
They say people have a moral sense, they say. And this, this view, this intuitionism, has a long history in academic ethics. So, and certainly people do have uh, consciences, they have feelings about what's right and wrong. So as an empirical fact, it's true that people have these. And they say that then people are imbued with a moral sense, and then the evolutionary ethicists say that this moral sense, its contents, the intuitions people have about right and wrong, arise basically uh, deterministically out of our evolutionary past. We feel certain things are good and certain things are bad because we've been uh, evolved to do that. Um, and there's much more that could be said about this and that whole topic, but here I just want to point out that if what they're saying is um, you have certain feelings that are imbued in you by your evolutionary past, so I, the, point, the point here is that, that then they're saying you have no choice about your ethics. You have no choice about uh, what you uh, decide is right and wrong. It's just uh, imbued in, in you. And to see why this is peculiar, you think of physical exercise. So when you do physical exercise, you may feel physical pain when you do it. And your pleasure pain mechanism is a basic barometer of good and bad for you. Uh, and that's instilled, the pleasure pain mechanism definitely instilled by evolution, right? It's a definite physical characteristic of a human being, right? But uh, just thinking about the decision of should I exercise or not, uh, you realize that the choices you need to make and the criteria for which you're going to think about choices have to go beyond what's just given to you as part of your constitution. You've got to uh, engage at something more broadly. So, uh, and you've got to recognize the fact that you're going to be choosing what to do. It's not that you just can't help it. Uh, you can exercise until you feel pain, and that might be good for you. But here, the, the idea is that we have ethics somehow uh, without any choice involved. So we want to talk about ethics uh, based on this uh, basic conception of why we need ethics. And if we think about this, then there are some implications about what a sound ethical system would be like that, uh, that come out of this conception. So if we're thinking about ethics as a code of principle for guiding one's choices, there are a couple basic implications. We're talking about all of one's choices, guiding all of your choices. Um, and that means that you have a, th a unity of theory and practice. It means you want an ethics that you can put into practice in guiding all your choices. You want a theory that covers uh, your choices. And you mean all your choices in all of life. And that means that ethics uh, is going to be comprehensive and relevant to, uh, to uh, and, re and related to all the relevant facts. And therefore, when you think of ethics, ethics can't be just a hodgepodge of principles. It has to be a body of systematic and logically coherent knowledge. It has to be uh, a whole corpus of knowledge that fits together systematically and logically because it's got to give this comprehensive treat treatment and this interrelated treatment of the whole swath of your life and all the issues you would be involved in. And uh, this fact that uh, ethics is uh, hierarchical and systematic uh, then means we need to pay attention to how it fits into the structure of philosophy. So ethical questions don't just come up ex nihilo, they don't just come up out of nowhere, they come up in a broader context. And in particular, the, the, the questions that ethics arises, the questions about uh, what are the nature of the choices we face, uh, what uh, are the standards by which we ought to make those choices, presume that we know, uh, that, that presume that there's some reality of which we know, and there's some facts uh, about uh, our lives and our choices, 
And it presumes that uh, in epistemology that we're capable of knowing those things, that we're capable of knowing something about them. And so there are implications for uh, what we know about the nature of reality and how do we know knowledge that are relevant for how we're going to do ethics. And in particular, just at a very basic level, if we think about the objectivist approach to metaphysics and epistemology, um, there are some just very basic facts that we'll want to be taking account while we do ethics, yeah, taking account of while we do ethics, and these are, the, in metaphysics, the axioms of existence and identity and causality and free will. Um, and uh, in epistemology, the fact that we're directly aware of reality through our senses and that we form knowledge by reasoning. Now, I mentioned this in the context of just describing what conceptual consciousness was, but here I want to cash out what the implications of the fact that we uh, are aware this way are for uh, ethics, for how we're going to do ethics. So from the metaphysical axioms, I think there are a couple implications right away for how we do ethics. Uh, number one, that there's no supernatural realm. There's no supernatural realm. Uh, why? Because the idea of the supernatural realm means a realm that isn't causally connected to existence as we know it. But uh, the axioms uh, remind us that everything that is, is, and everything that is, uh, is causally related to everything else. And so uh, that you could know something, or that something could affect you in your life would only be possible because it was causally related to your life. That's, it would only be possible. So it couldn't be that there would be some realm that exists and is relevant to us, you know, that exists meaningfully for us, that, but, but is not related to us through any particular means. It's not related to us through any method that we can discern. It doesn't operate on some wavelength of uh, electromagnetism, it, uh, it exists on no wavelength of electromagnetism, nor does it operate by any other force. And so that's basically the idea of the supernatural, is that whatever natural laws, whatever causality you've established, it isn't that. Well, if it isn't that, then it's not relevant for ethics. And I, another uh, basic thing is because there is causality, then our ethical principles will be of the form of relating cause and effect. Uh, they won't be, say, merely declarations of fact. They'll be causal explanations. They'll be causally uh, connected. So that's something we're going to look for in ethical discussion. So if people say, well, such and such a thing is just good, we're going to be uncomfortable with that because we're going to want a causal explanation. And that's, I mean, I, I don't want I don't think you, at this level of methodology, I don't think you can uh, prejudice what, the, uh, what you're going to find out as you investigate the facts. You could find out a lot of different things, but you're going to want a causal explanation. And in epistemology, um, well, some of the implications are that, well, because we're directly aware of reality through our senses, well, this means that intuitions and emotions are not special faculties of moral awareness. When at the very least, I'd mentioned this earlier in talking about evolutionary ethics, that they'd assume this intuitionist perspective, and I didn't want to focus on that aspect then, but I just want to point out here that if we're coming at this from the, uh, the epistemology of objectivism, then, and really the epistemology of reason generally, uh, Someone who says that emotions or intuitions are special faculties of moral awareness has a tall hill to climb. They're going to have to explain how this can be because the standard by which we judge all truth is relating it back to the evidence of our senses. Um, and generally, it's not the case that we judge truth by intuition or emotion. Um, and, uh, so those are not generally uh, considered our senses. And because we form knowledge by reasoning, the other, another important thing is that ethical knowledge is based in facts. Uh, so if someone says that ethical knowledge is mm, 
sui generis or factual knowledge isn't ethical knowledge. That just can't be, uh, from the, this approach, they, they, that just can't be right. Uh, ethical knowledge has to be some kind of natural account of something. It has to be, a, it has to be of a piece with science. It has to be um, factual, empirical knowledge. So these are these basic implications for ethics. <coughs> now, the dominant school of ethics in the universities these days is analytic ethics, or has been for, well, gosh, it's getting on towards 75 years, <laughs> is uh, analytic ethics based in the tradition of conceptual analysis. And this approach to philosophy generally has some things in its favor. Uh, it uh, emphasizes logical clarity. It uh, emphasizes uh, looking into ambiguities in language and meaning to attain greater clarity. And in those aspects, uh, those, are, those are good methods, and that's a good thing to do. But it also has a very unsystematic and anti-factual character. So in its in uh, analytic ethics approach as conceptual analysis, um, it, the, a lot of the work in ethics tends to be about explaining moral talk and not about guiding choices. So it tends to say, well, we see people use moral language in this way, uh, now we want to explain why they use moral language in this way. Um, and this has the peculiar implication that people debate meta-ethics, they debate fundamental conceptions of the good, like utilitarianism versus Kantianism, or, uh, you know, and, and uh, for that matter, uh, uh, eudaimonism. Uh, they, they debate these, but they often, when they debate them, um, think that the whole debate is completely divorced from the question of normative ethics, that it's, it, it needn't be relevant. So they're looking, they're, they're asking, what is the meta-ethics that best explains how people use moral talk? Not how you should live. So not, not what is the conception of the good that should then drive or underlie all of your other choices, but rather uh, what is the conception of the good that seems to fit best with moral talk as people normally do it? Um, so it, rather than trying to give us moral knowledge, it's like mm, trying to um, summarize the moral knowledge we already have. Another aspect of analytic ethics is that it tends to be socially oriented. Um, there's a strong tradition in analytic ethics of distinguishing between moral reasoning and practical reasoning. And then what is moral reasoning on this concept? Moral reasoning is um, thinking about how you deal with other people or thinking about your duties towards other people. Um, and so it, ethics is then in this conception no longer a guide to making all your choices. So I have a friend who's uh, an analytic philosopher and at one point we paused, we were talking about ethics and uh, I was just saying, you know, what do I conceive? Uh, he'd invited me to an ethics workshop. I'd gone, we were talking about it. And I said, you know, um, I think of ethics as a guide to all your choices. And he looked at me and he said, that sounds like psychology to me. So he didn't think that was even ethics. He didn't think that was even ethics. And the, the effect of doing this is just to leave a whole lot of the concerns that are important in our lives, concerns about say, what career you would take, or what kind of job you would do, or um, uh, how you would order your own thinking, or how you would achieve, achieve spiritual equanimity. Uh, all these things uh, may not be relevant for ethics at all, because they're practical concerns in their view. But this you know, tears it all uh, apart. And this cashes out actually also in some ethics textbooks where there are quite a few, there are several uh, ethics textbooks. In fact, uh, the philosopher Irfan Kawaja has an essay about this on the Reason Papers website. Um, 
uh, an essay about this fact, surveying a bunch of textbooks that do this, but I've noticed this for quite some years. They, there's a standard form of some textbooks. You know, Ayn Rand is very popular, so they put Ayn Rand right at the beginning, and then Ayn Rand is an egoist. So they say, well, here's egoism. That's not even ethics at all. Now the rest of this book will be about ethics. Right? But what they don't say is ethics is um, a code of values a body of principles for guiding one's choices. That's what they don't say. Right. Uh, and so in this, in this view, they end up also with an idea of ethics as non-factual. In fact, this is, I think, perhaps driving some of this, uh, these distinctions between moral reasoning and practical reasoning. So they've accepted an idea that there's a distinction between is and ought, or that it's a fallacy called the naturalist fallacy, that it's a fallacy to speak of uh, moral uh, issues in natural terms, or to think that uh, the moral concepts in some sense reduce to uh, non-moral uh, terms or issues. That's called the naturalist fallacy. But then ethics has to be non-factual, basically, if you think that. Um, and as I've seen, said earlier, uh, we've got real reasons to think that all of our knowledge is factual. So if ethics is knowledge, it's going to be factual. Now, uh, so having surveyed the requirements of a sound ethical system and emphasized that it's going to be uh, systematic, it's going to be hierarchical, it's going to be factual, it's going to comply with certain other desiderata, uh, you know, it won't be about the supernatural. Uh, it won't uh, be cut off from uh, practical issues. Uh, uh, we're ready to talk a little bit more about uh, ethical concepts. So, and I want to talk about values and virtues in this concept to set us up for the rest of our discussion. You know, Ayn Rand said in the Objectivist Ethics that uh, Ayn Rand his approach to any issue was to ask um, what uh, is uh, the meaning of this concept and why do we need it? And that's a good way to come at any issue. But she said to challenge the basic premises of any discipline, one must begin at the beginning. One must begin by asking what are values and why does man need them? And we've talked about the, the why a little bit, but the what, um, uh, I'd like to expand on that. Uh, so uh, Rand's uh, pithy characterization, she says, value is that which one acts to gain and or keep, and virtue is the act by which one gains and or, keep it and or keeps it. And this conception of value, it's important not only to think of value as the goals one aim, aims at, um, but also to think of value um, in terms of something that one's, act, that one's actively engaged in. So Rand wants to draw a distinction between merely wishing for something or idly wishing for something and really genuinely uh, valuing it. And then uh, virtue is the action that one uses to gain the values in the, in the broadest sense. In this conception, um, then, uh, all of ethics is basically teleological. Teleological means goal-oriented, about being aimed at goals, and the values are the goals that uh, ethical principles help uh, uh, aim to help us uh, achieve. So many ethical concepts, ethical concepts like good and evil, or right and wrong, or beautiful and ugly, I mean, all these concepts when you think about them, are based in a fundamental distinction between value and disvalue. So in a sense, when we say something is good or it's right, uh, we say that it's, that's the thing that someone ought to aim for, that's the kind of thing one ought to achieve, and when we say something's evil or wrong, what we mean is it's disvaluable, it's a goal that you don't want to have achieve. And similarly, when we say be uh, something's beautiful, we mean that it's desirable and precious, um, and we mean that it's a value to be aimed for. We say something is ugly. We mean that it's uh, you know, less valuable in that respect. So that's this uh, conception of ethics as teleological. 
And so uh, ethics is going to be based in the identification of these of fundamental facts. And uh, among these fundamental facts are going to be fundamental values. And then we're going to think of virtues as existing for the purpose of securing those values. So the virtues exist teleologically. They exist for a goal, for a purpose. And the purpose is attaining the values. Now, when people speak of virtue, you know, virtue, virtues are, no. uh, virtues are, in a sense, uh, actions. They're actions you take to gain values. Um, when we think of why we should take those actions or how those actions are characterized, we conceive of them in terms of principles. So the virtues are principles. But uh, uh, virtues are also part of our character. And your, your character uh, consists in your uh, dispositions and habits. So your character consists in uh, uh, the way you characteristically act. And it includes um, subconscious habits you have, uh, your tendency to do something. How do you tend to react in a given situation? Um, that's all part of your character. And these are all, these are subconscious. They're, they're things you learn. Um, and you can uh, teach yourself new habits, uh, new uh, uh, approaches to do things. The important thing here is that your moral habits imp uh, uh, implement uh, uh, the, the application of moral principles in your action so that your moral principles inculcate in you uh, the ability to, um, uh, if you, uh, your moral habits are going to be habits that are, uh, that enact uh, the right kind of moral action in a given situation. And so in this sense, virtues are dispositions to act on moral principles. So your virtues, um, so have, saying that someone is virtuous doesn't simply mean that they act in the right way, but it will mean over the long term that they develop the disposition to act in that way. It doesn't mean that they just know a principle, it means that they have the subconscious dis uh, disposition to know how to apply that principle and to implement that principle in their actions. So in that sense, uh, when we speak of virtues, we speak not merely of uh, the action itself, but over the long term, we're speaking about the development of a kind of character and developing uh, certain kinds of uh, habitual uh, dispositional tendencies in your actions. And so, in that sense, I'd like to just um, uh, conclude by speaking about the virtue of integrity which I think we can say something about, uh, again, without really recurring to the egoism of the objectivist ethics at all. Because if we think about value and virtue in this way, um, then a virtue is a policy of acting according to moral principles. And integrity, the virtue of integrity, is fundamentally the policy of acting in, in accordance with one's principles. Not just one's moral principles, but all of one's principles. It's the, it's the idea that if one has knowledge, one ought to put it into use. If one has knowledge, one ought to act in terms of it. Uh, one ought to act consistently with what one knows to be true. That's what um, integrity is. And so uh, refined, that means um, in its core, it means knowing what are the key principles for all, of, for all your activity and acting in according with them. And so in that sense, integrity is the virtue of being virtuous, <laughs> right? Because it's the, it's the virtue of acting in terms of virtues. And because it's the virtue of acting consistently in terms of your virtues, when you act consistently in terms of your virtues, um, it will turn your, at your, your pattern of action into automatized habits or dispositions. So it will inculcate into you virtue uh, as part of your habit of, act, of action. So uh, it's 
the virtue, so it's the virtue of being virtuous in two ways, because it's the virtue of being virtuous in being consistent with your principles, and it's the virtue that will make you more vir virtuous as you practice it, make you more deeply and profoundly virtuous. And that's cool. So that's a neat thing about integrity. So just to summarize what I was trying to talk about in this talk, to set us up, at least in stage one of the Objectivist Mele Ethics, um, I've spoken about ethics as a code of principle to guide one's choices, and I've emphasized that it requires identifying fundamental values and the virtues they imply, and that we're looking for an ethic that's objective and comprehensive. And this is the thing where it's on this level. It's like my, my friend who said I was just talking about psychology. This is where I just, or the workshop I was in, where I, I just couldn't, I couldn't quite understand what they thought they were talking about. Because if you're not coming at moral questions on this issue, if you don't think people have to make choices, that they require a code of principles, that ethics is that code of principles to guide all your choices, and that ethics has to be objective and comprehensive, it has to be based in fundamentals. I find as an objectivist, I'm then having trouble communicating. And I think when we, when we try to think about uh, ethical talk and discuss ethical issues with other people or assimilate other ethical arguments, um, we need to bear in mind whether or not people are taking these fundamental attitudes about ethics seriously or not, whether they're doing what objectivists would call ethics at all. So that's where I leave us at this point. Um, and with that, I'll take your questions. If you have questions, come up to the mic here to help the recording. Thanks. Um, when one asks uh, a question of should, is, uh -huh. the, is the word should always in application to morality or is it also in the realm of aesthetics? Because when you ask the question should, it could be in terms of universal principles, but it could also be in terms of concrete. But would the, a concrete decision that you're making, perhaps an aesthetic decision, require previous convictions on universalization? Um, uh, I see. I think you were asking is when we use the term should, are we presuming a universal ethic? Or were you just asking whether we're like, using like, a normative term? Well, when one, if you say should, does that mean that any time you say should or any time there's a decision, that decision is a moral decision? Um, I think in the objectivist conception, um, Setting aside a subtlety in what we mean by moral, the answer is yes, or morality would be relevant. Um, and I think the terms like should and ought, I think they exist for the very reason that we need morality. I think they exist, and this is uh, just my thought on it, but I think they exist because we have to make choices, we're continually confronted with the necessity to identify which is the choice, this, this is so fundamental it's hard to get around it, but which is the choice that is to be preferred? Which choice ought you to make? Which choice would be the right one? You know, you're gonna choose among some choices, you have to designate some as the one you won't do and one as the one you will do, right? And I think that those terms come from that and they, the, one of the reasons why they get tangled up in this idea of there being an is-ought dichotomy or um, ethics as being a separate field is because they relate to this very fundamental aspect of our, our existence. Um, and so, and they're, they're pervasive in that way. Um, now, you mentioned aesthetics. A aesthetics, I have a slide on this. There we go. Aesthetics is downstream in the structure of philosophy. So statements in aesthetics depend on metaphysics, they depend on epistemology, 
they depend on ethics. Actually, aesthetics and politics are more or less on the same level, but they depend on uh, ethics. And so when you use uh, normative terms in ethics, you speak of uh, what you ought to do, um, you're um, depending on certain uh, ethical concepts when you do that. Now, there's also a way in which we say someone ought to do something. We mean just its uh, fitness or aptness. Or um, my computer was not <coughs> connecting to the projector in quite the right, right way this morning. And normally, when you use these slideshows, they've got this wonderful technology called Presenter View, where they show the presenter something a little different than what shows up on the screen. It like shows you what's the next slide and some notes and things like that. And it just wasn't working right. It kept showing the presenter view over there and not where I needed it. So um, certainly, I felt like it should have been working a different way. It ought to be doing something different. And what do I mean when I say that? I mean both I want it to do something different. For my values, it would be good if it would do those things. But also, and as far as I understand the design and purpose of the program, the way I understand it to normally work when it's functioning in, in the way it's meant, what it was designed to do, then it should do that. So when we talk about, say, our designed machines and designed operations, we think about, are they operating the way they should, right? So there's that sense of, are they, are they achieving the ends in the proper way we wanted them to? Or are they fitting with the design that we chose? Um, so I've, that's, I, that's, those are my thoughts on should uh, and I think in aesthetics, I, just to come back to in aesthetics, I think a lot of times when people say should in aesthetics, it is just an ethical should. But there can be this subtle um, aptness or fitness to ends idea, which I think is fundamentally ethical because we, we're speaking about the teleological character of ethical concepts. Um, but uh, it's, you're not, say, appealing to broader ethical principles when you speak about that aptness or uh, fitness. Thank you. Thank you. I also have uh, uh, problems now and then with the is and the ought and how much uh, comes with, within us and how much might be affected by uh, external world. Uh, my, my other uh, comment was about uh, emotions. The disposition that you speak of is related to something that's almost automatic, but of course it's not really automatic. Uh, do our emotions more automatic when, you, when a person has a disposition to do, to pursue values, to be virtuous, and, and so forth? <laughs> that disposition also invites in her emotions from previous, uh, from previous experience in, in the life. That might not make any sense, but uh, comment about how emotions fit into the disposition. Um, yeah, I'll have more to say about emotions um, when I come back in the afternoon, although not a lot, because uh, I could talk about that some more. But I will put in a plug in our Atlas University section. David and I have been steadily building out a course in the objectivist epistemology. It's called Reason. It's a set of 30-minute video lectures that we made, and one of those is on reason and emotion, and I recorded it, and I say most everything I have to say about emotions <laughs> <laughs> in there. So if you want the fuller dope, um, uh, although in our research workshop, we have a regular monthly uh, research workshop where a bunch of philosophers and scholars get together. We've had a couple on emotions, actually, and digging into that some more. So it's a rich topic. That said, yes, in speaking about dispositions and habits, I was certainly talking about something that's relevant for people's emotions. And the idea of um, living with integrity and inculcating into yourself moral principles and moral dispositions, the Aristotelians then say, well, then that's so you will feel the right way about doing the right thing. You will feel the right emotion 
in the right circumstance. And I think that's the idea, anyway, that's here. Um, but uh, I wasn't, yeah, I was careful, I was trying to be careful in this talk to not make any particular claim about the plasticity of our emotions or to what extent um, you can say, uh, take emotional dispositions that you already have and transform them into others. I, I think that's a more subtle issue of psychology and would deserve a fuller discussion. Um, so you in your question, uh, Donna, had said, um, it had hinted, well, maybe what if you have, say, emotions from prior experiences, won't those might maybe be different from what you uh, develop in the course of uh, inculcating into yourself the dispositions of virtue? I, I think that's what you were partly asking. And um, I, I'm just, I think, Certainly, we're not instantly plastic. And if you read Ayn Rand sometimes, she gives you the impression that if people would just think the right thoughts, then they would feel the right things. Like that. Um, in her you know, more reflective moments, she doesn't say that. But um, sometimes she does sound that way. And I think that certainly would be incorrect on an understanding of human nature. But um, how plastic we are and you know, I think one of the things about objectivism is um, recognizing that in the history of objectivism there was some brutalizing psychology and sort of uh, nasty psychotherapy uh, connected with objectivism. Yet still, we need a more developed psychotherapy in objectivism. We need a more developed set of therapies for someone to use who's on the premise of um, living virtuously and a, developing a harmonious set of emotional and moral dispositions. And I don't think we've explored all the, mm, shall we say, technological possibilities, all the possibilities for therapy and practice and trying to work through these issues. So I think there's um, hope for better, happier lives and more advances in those areas. Uh, I, that's that's where I leave it. Thanks. And Heather? Hello, Heather Wagonhalls here. And I have a question that kind of deals with emotions and ethics a little bit too. So our ethical system that we operate on today has almost nothing to do with this. It had to do with what our parents kind of bred into us, if you will, and then our culmination of how we responded to different stimulus in our environment shaped who we are. So how do we approach this idea of ethics when I thought you know, ideally that I was already operating ethically but now I'm coming to find out that perhaps I'm not. If I think the way I'm thinking and because my first brain tells me it's you know seek pleasure and avoid pain but seeking pleasure isn't always good how do I know based on my previous experience that I should be identifying something different and choosing a more virtuous path versus the one that I've been on. Does that make sense? Um, well, by not getting into the egoism of the objectivist ethics or the substantive conception of human life and the, the, the nature of value for a human being, um, I've not talked about some of these issues, but they're lurking there. Yes, they're, they are. They're there. Um, I think in what you said in your question, you, you asked, aren't we given a certain ethical framework and doesn't this kind of approach call that into question? And I think yes, the answer is yes, that the objectivist conception of ethics is to come to the question of um, how should I guide my choices? What principles are there for guiding my choices? and think it all anew. That's the objectivist approach. And that's what Ayn Rand did. Ayn Rand, you know, in the objectivist ethics says, we're going to ask what are values and why does one need them? We're not going to say, what is good and evil? We're not going to say, what is virtue and what is not virtue? That's not where we're gonna start. We're gonna ask at the very uh, fundament fundamental, 
what is this idea of value and why is it relevant at all? And then, so this is the revolutionary aspect of the objectivist ethics, but in this sense, it's like science. So no science says what we know about reality is because we were handed that down from the past. No, the scientists say what we know about physics or chemistry, we know because that's the best account we've got of the facts in that field. We don't know any better account. We've gone back, we've thrown away everything that was given to us. We've asked of everything that was given to us, is it true, is it relevant? And that's what objectivism wants to do with ethics. It says we have to do that with ethics. We have to think that way about ethics. Um, now, we're gonna find that some of the things that were handed down to us are bonza good, they're, they're excellent, um, and some of the things that were handed down to us are not. That's what we find. And it could have happened that everything that was handed down to us was fantastic. Um, but uh, in truth, we're going to find that some of it is and some of it isn't. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Let's take one more. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, I've always looked at the objectivist ethics as opposed to most other ethical system. Uh, its strong point is what motivates you in the first place to have ethics. Uh, most other systems, it seems to me, believe that you should have an ethical system to overcome your human nature, which is evil. And I, and I think that's the ethics that has, has moved the world. So even if they come out with, uh, you know, love thy neighbor, uh, do unto others, those are good principles, but they're not based on a good motivation in the first place, and I think that's what really separates our ethics and makes it better. Right. Like Kant comes down uh, endorsing something like the golden rule, right? That's where he comes down. But, but he goes to some trouble to rework the whole foundation. And then, you know, anyone who takes that reworking seriously, they're going to end up some other places. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's uh, in this, in. Uh, when David comes back in the next session, he'll be talking more about the why it matters, you know, the, the, the how much it matters for us, and what is it about us that makes it really matter so much, you know, ethics. But uh, uh, certainly that's key. All right, thank you all. We'll be back in about 15 minutes.